Okay, good afternoon. Here we start. Hmm? Okay, thank you for your participation. I have got quite a lot of emails, suggestion what to do today. And it looks like the demand is higher than supply. <laughs> we don't have or capacity. Uh, we don't have sufficient time. But I will try today to cover as much as possible. So what I did for today, I tried to uh, take exercises from the handbook mm -hmm. to cover your questions. So uh, next lecture on Friday, we will go through exams mm -hmm, that are uh, on Fronter. Mm -hmm, OK? So first of all, today we will start with game theory. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of exercises, and then we go to proper models. My first question to you, do you really understand everything about um, mixed strategy equilibrium? Hmm? Do you want an exercise on that? Yes. OK, good. So then please open chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And this is exercise number 12. The chapter is called Game Theory, a Framework for Understanding Oligopolistic Behavior. Hmm? So right here, 7, 12. Yeah? Here we have two companies, Coke and Pepsi, and a simultaneous game that has the following payoff structure. This is heavy advertising. These are low prices. And this is player 2 Pepsi. Here is Coke. This is a developed new product. And this is not a developed new product. And this is Coke. The payoffs are the following. 1,000, 1,200. Here is 1,200. 1200 So first of all we are ask, uh, asked does Pepsi have a dominant strategy explain your reasoning and does Coke have a dominant strategy explain your reasoning and then solve for the Nash equilibrium of the game and in brackets it is stated mixed strategy equilibrium we can guess at least, uh, at least that if we are asked to find a mixed strategy equilibrium, for sure there are no dominant strategies. Yeah? So how do we reason? The simplest way would be the following. Say, if I am Coke mm -hmm, and I consider what is my best response uh, for the heavy advertising strategy of my opponent. Yeah? So if Coke develops a product, it gets 1,000. If not develops, it gets 1,200. Yeah? Therefore, we put a star here. Mm -hmm. my, the best response of player 1 to the first strategy of player 2. Then uh, we consider what is the best response of player 1 to the second strategy of player 2. So again, if uh, Coke develops the produ product, it gets 1,200. If not developed, it gets 1,100. Uh, yeah? So best response is here. These two stars that are placed on different strategies, it means for us that there is no dominant strategy for Coke. Yeah? What is dominant strategy? That is a strategy that is always a best response to any strategy of the opponent. Yeah? Here, my best response includes two different strategies. Mm -hmm. Now I apply similar reasoning for player two. Uh, Pepsi thinks, OK, if Coke decides to develop a product, what is my best response? I compare 1,200 to 800. It looks like this one is better. Yeah? Then what if Coke does not develop anything? Then best response is between these two. This is this one. So again, 
For Pepsi, it looks like there is no dominant strategy. Mm -hmm. Simply because my best respond, response includes two different strategies. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, now where we put all the stars, we see that there is no any outcome here uh, that has two stars. What does it mean? It means that there is no Nash equilibrium in pure strategies. Yeah? Because what is, what is the equilibrium? Equilibrium, this is such a strategy profile, such strategies that are best responses to each other. Yeah? Or this is the outcome where two players, both players, are best responding. So there is no such situation on this payoff. Therefore, we go for mixed strategies. Uh, there is a famous uh, theorem by John Nash, who actually got the Nobel Prize exactly for this uh, theorem, that takes uh, that says that there is always at least one Nash equilibrium in any game that has finite uh, number of strategies and finite number of players. Mm -hmm. But he uh, talked about mixed strategies equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So if we are not able to find any pure strategy Nash equilibrium, uh, we always are sure that it is possible to find something in mixed strategies. Mm -hmm. How we do that? Uh, we assume that both players can randomize over their strategies. Say Pepsi, we can assign probability Q that it will use strategy 1 and probability 1 minus Q that it will use strategy 2. We do the same here. So we assign probability, say, P for using strategy 1 and probability 1 minus P for using strategy 2. Mm -hmm. Then there is sort of a trick. How should player 1 find P in 1 minus P? Mm -hmm. He should find these probabilities such that the other player would be indifferent bet between his strategies. Why so? Because, say, if I f um, define my piece such that Pepsi is better off by playing first strategy, he will always play that. Mm -hmm. So I sort of give him an advantage. Therefore, when I choose these probabilities, if I'm player one, I want to make him indifferent between what he does, this or this. How I do that? Say, I know that, well, if I play um, develop with probability P, the uh, expected payoff of second player, I will say payoff expected of player 2, yeah, right like that. That will be 1200 with probability P, yeah, and plus, okay, say, um, we will take it here, pay off of player 2 expected by playing first strategy, heavily advertising. Mm -hmm. So his payoff is 1200 multiplied by P plus 1200 multiplied by P minus 1. one, one. Oh, yeah, thank you. I see that you're attentive. That's good. <laughs> 1 minus p. Huh? So this is the expected utility from, from playing this strategy, given that the opponent cap can play his strategies with these probabilities. Mm -hmm. Then what will be the expected payoff of second player if he plays low prices? That will be this 800 multiplied by P plus 1600 multiplied by 1 minus P. Mm -hmm. And now I say that I want, as a player 1, to find this P and 1 minus P such that the opponent will be indifferent between these two strategies. To be indifferent, it means that expected utility from playing both is equal. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I make an equal sign between these two equations. Hmm? So now from here, I can derive my p. Make sense? Now it's a doubtful silence now. <laughs> well, OK, we try.
So it turns out that in order to make the opponent indifferent between these two strategies, player one has to play first strategy with probability one over two, yeah, or in half of time, half times, and half times he plays the second strategy. But this is only one part of equilibrium, only one part of solution. Now we should do just the same for another player. Mm -hmm. So player two, he chooses q and one minus q such that player one is indifferent between these two strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, what it will be? Say, if player um, one plays develop, he gets 1,000 with probability q plus 1,200 with probability 1 minus q, yeah, right? And it is equal to 1,200 with probability q plus 1,000 with probability 1 minus q. Mm -hmm. So what I do here, this is my first strategy. I multiply this 1,000 to probability q, this 1,200 to probability 1 minus q. And I equate that to 1,200 uh, multiplied by q plus uh, 1,000 multiplied by 1 minus q. Mm -hmm. So if we open all these brackets, we will again get q equal to 1 over 2. Mm -hmm. So the second player does the same. He randomizes equally between two strategies. Mm -hmm. So and now, this is my equilibrium. So what is the strategy of first player? The strategy is to randomize between these two pure strategies. Yeah? Randomize with equal probability. The strategy of another player is to randomize with equal probability between his two strategies. So this is how it works. Um, will you be able to solve something like that? No. Why so? Well, algebraically it's very, very simple. Yeah? You will not get anything larger than this payoff 2 by 2. Mm -hmm. So then just to summarize, the logic is the following. I first things that I do, I check whether there is any equilibrium in pure strategy. If there is no such an equilibrium, mm -hmm. I go for mixed strategies. Then mixed strategies, it means that uh, my players randomize between the actions. Therefore, I assign some probabilities for one player, some probabilities for another player. Mm -hmm. And then to choose probabilities uh, for one player, I want to make another player indifferent between his actions. That's it. This is the whole logic. Hmm? Again, just to come back one step, uh, one step back. Imagine now that, for example, I found, I find such p in 1 minus p that um, playing heavy advertising is always better than playing uh, low price. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I give my opponent the advantage of always winning because he's all, he will always play this one huh? because he will be better off because of that. That's why I want to make him indifferent. And he does the same. And then I come to the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, next exercise. I have got a question, rather tricky, I would say, from chapter 9. And this is exercise 4. Chapter 9, exercise 4. Huh? Suppose in a duopoly market with uncertainty, market demand is uh, P equal to 1000 minus 2Q. Mm -hmm. 
and both firms have cost equal to marginal cost one equal to average cost one equal to marginal cost two equal to average cost two and equal to 200. By the way, just to make sure, in some exercises, you meet uh, uh, the concept of variable costs. Mm -hmm. Don't be confused about that. It's just the same. It's simply to distinguish between what is fixed costs that are taken for the production as such, and not depending on the quantity produced, yeah? and variable costs. Usually it is said with constant variable costs. It means that constant, like marginal cost, are equal to average cost. Yeah? It is constant. And variable, it means that it depends on the number of units that you produce. That's it. So don't be confused, confused about that. Um, so now suppose that both firms adopt the following strategies. Um, first, they start by cooperating with each, other, with each firm, charging the joint profit maximizing collusive price. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? So they collude here. The second strategy is that continue to sell at the joint profit maximizing outputs and price unless the other firm increases its output and lowers its price, in which case produce the Cournot Nash quantity and charge the Cournot Nash price. So here, say, this is actually a Grimm trigger strategy. Huh? This is something like that, that, well, this is a prisoner's dilemma. If we both collude, we will get higher profit, profits. Each of us has an incentive to deviate to increase profits at least once. once. But then if you do that, you will be punished forever after. Mm -hmm. So this is Grimm trigger strategy. Um, so the probability that the game is played in the next period is 0 0.99. So rho is 99%. So it tells us that, OK, this is a repeated game. But we know that it may suddenly stop at some point. So each of the players considers the situation that it may just end up. Mm -hmm. um, we have to find the discount rate that will sustain collusion. So we know that on the market, companies value uh, its profit in this period higher than the same profit next period yeah, because of discount rate. So in this case, this I discount rate is unknown. We have to find that. Well, now you help me. Where do we start with the game like that? Well, of course, if we talk about f uh, repeated game and we talk about prisoner's dilemma, we have to start with a table. Mm -hmm. We should understand what to write in which, in which cell. Mm -hmm. Say, this is firm 2 and this is firm 1. They both have two strategies, either to collude or to defect. Collude and defect. Mm -hmm. And now my task is to find what I should write in these cells. Mm -hmm. Let me start with collude, collude. What if they agree to agree upon prices and outputs? So now you are smart economists. What is the highest profit possible on the market? Hmm? Think about market, market structures. Which market structure gives the highest profit? Oh, come on, please help me. Exactly. So we know that if there is only one player on the market, it's a monopolist, he earns its monopoly profit. It's very high. Yeah? Then if someone comes to the market, suddenly we see that uh, the output increases because there are two of them. Yeah? The prices goes down. And then both of them uh, earn some profit, positive profit. But still, even the sum of these two profits is lower than the profit that the monopolist would have earned himself. Mm? Therefore, the logic of collusion, collusion would be the following. Well, what if we agree 
and act as a monopolist, two of us. Mm -hmm. So we find a monopolistic output, monopolistic price, and then just share the market. Mm -hmm. So we decide, okay, if we two acting as one company, we are a monopolist. Mm -hmm. We uh, define Q and then split it between us. I produce half of monopolistic output, you produce another part. Mm -hmm. And the, in then we share the profit. And this profit would certainly be higher uh, than uh, something that we would earn if we just played our equilibrium strategies. Mm -hmm. But then uh, the logic is the following. Is that, OK, well, we, we agreed. We act as a monopolist. But then some of us, or both of us, has an incentive to decrease price a little bit and to increase profit. In this case, I suddenly can, earn, can get the whole market because we produce the same product. Mm -hmm. So by deviating once, I can capture the whole monopolistic profit. Mm -hmm. But then you tell me, OK, if you do it once, I will punish you forever. Then we will not collude, and we will produce our equilibrium quantities that are prescribed by Cournot equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So what we should do now is find this monopolistic profit. Mm -hmm and to find Nash equilibrium. That's it. So in order to fill all these cells, we have to solve more or less two simple exercises. So first, first strategy or first outcome is collude, collude. Mm -hmm. Profit maximization. Um, this is my demand function. If I am a monopolist, I want to equate my marginal revenue of monopoly to marginal costs of monopoly. Mm -hmm. Marginal revenue is equal to 1000 minus 4Q. Q is the total production in the, in the industry. And it is equal to 200. Right? Mm -hmm. From here, Q is equal to 200. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then from here, I can find the price. The price is equal to 600. Hmm? So if the industry structure was uh, monopolistic, then that would be the price on the market, and that would be the total output. But I have two companies, and they split it between themselves. So from here, I say that Q1 will be 100, and Q2 will be 100 as well. Hmm? And then profits. Profit of first company will be equal to profit of the second company. This will be 100 to 600 and minus marginal costs. Um, so from here, I get monopolistic profit equal to 40,000 for each of the players. Mm -hmm. So therefore, here I write. 40,000 for this guy and 40,000 for another guy. Mm -hmm. And now I say, what if one of them defects? He captures the whole market and he earns the whole monopolistic profit. It will be 80,000. So if this Kaluz still produces the same and th it's the, uh, this one defects. So probably I should write minus some epsilon here yeah? because it will be a bit lower, marginally lower. Here we'll get zero. And symmetric here. And then we say that alternative strategy is Grimm trigger. Yeah? So in this one will be Cournot Nash equilibrium. Here I should write find Nash equilibrium quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, in Cournot model. What we should do? Then now I write in the beginning that price is equal to 100 minus 2q1 and minus 2q2, right? Mm -hmm. Marginal revenue of first firm will be 1,000. Then he considers this quantity huh? minus 4q1 and minus 2q2 because now it is sort of constant. So I do nothing about that. I apply twice a steep rule to the quantity produced by the companies that I am considering now. Mm -hmm. And I this is equal to marginal costs, to 200. Uh -huh. um, f 
from here we get best response curve of firm one it will be 200 minus half of q2 right mm -hmm. and then by symmetry we have just symmetric case we can write that the best response curve of another player will be just the same q1 mm -hmm. and from here we can find the equilibrium output yeah? I just take this Q1, put it into this equation, mm -hmm. and derive Q1 and Q2. No need to do that. Yeah? So Q1 is equal to Q2, and in this case it will be 133. Mm -hmm. The price. Price will be 1000 minus 2 multiplied by 266. Huh? This is the total uh, output, and by 2, so I get price equal to 468. Mm -hmm. With new price and new quantities, I get symmetric payoff, the, uh, the profits, and it will be 35644. Mm -hmm. So here I write new payoffs. So now look at this payoff structure. This is exactly prisoner's dilemma game. Yeah? So if uh, okay, dominant strategies for both of them would be always to defect. Mm -hmm. So and Nash equilibrium will be on this point. Yeah? But we know that if they manage to sustain cooperation, then they can earn more. Mm -hmm. The question is, okay, given that uh, the game can suddenly finish at some point mm -hmm. with probability 0 0.99 it ends in the next period in some period t we have to find what is the discount rate for the companies that will sustain this cooperation mm -hmm. that will make more profitable to collude than to defect mm -hmm. the logic is more or less clear uh, here <laughs> so, uh, in order to sustain cooperation, I want that my profit from collusion, collude, and I say pro present value of this profit mm -hmm, should be larger than the profit from defecting and again present value. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to get. And from this I should find this discount rate that will make this inequality work. Mm -hmm. How I find present value of collusion, this will be, say, in first period I get 40,000. Uh, 40, in the next period, it will be 40,000, again, if we still collude, but I have to discount that, mm -hmm. because it has a little bit lower value in the next period, in period, if this is period 0, then this is period 1. But in addition to that, I know that I will get this payoff only with some probability, because in this period, my game can just finish. Mm -hmm. So I multiply that by some probability rho. Mm -hmm. Then plus, again, in my period 2, I have to discount it once again, but now I discount it twice. Mm -hmm. So I multiply that again by that. And in period 2, I have to take this probability that the game could have finished in the previous uh, period and multiply it by probability rho again. So this is a square. Mm -hmm. And now you can imagine what we get. Plus, that will be 40, 1 plus i to some n, rho to the power of n, and so on. So, and this is infinite polynomial. Huh? What can you do with that, to simplify it a little bit? Look, I can write present value collude is equal to 40, um, 
plus I take once this thing, this part, I exclude it from equation, and then suddenly from here what I get. So if I take this part away from all what is rest, I get suddenly just the same again. Look. Mm -hmm. So here I will get 40 plus 40 to rho 1 my plus i, and so on. Yeah? So look, here in brackets, I get again just the same. Mm -hmm. So from here I can write that p pre, uh, profit from collusion present value it will be 40,000 plus rho 1 plus i and multiply it again by this present value. Mm -hmm. Because in brackets it's again the same. The sequence is just infinite. Mm -hmm. So from here I can just express present value from collusion. Um, it will be Mm -hmm. And my rho is equal to 0 0.99. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Look, here I have present value from collusion, present value from collusion again. I can just express it algebraically. Um, that will be 40,000 uh, equal to rho plus i minus 1 to present value from collusion. Yeah? From here I can express it. Can this? No, this is minus 40. Mm -hmm. Then I do, do just the same for present value of profit from defecting. Just with some uh, change, because in first period I get 80,000, yeah? because I defect right here. But after that, forever after, I get this small payoff. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth with this powers. If I simplify this just in the same way, mm -hmm. I will get a little bit different expression, but this will be present value of profit from defecting um, will be 80,000 plus uh, 35644 plus i divided by 1 minus 0 0.99 1 plus i. Mm -hmm. And now we see that uh, this story mm -hmm, present value from collusion should be larger than what we found here uh, from this inequality. Mm -hmm. So we have many weird digits here but we have only one unknown, and this is i. Mm -hmm. So if I apply just simple algebra, from here I can express i. Mm -hmm. You see? Here it's some numbers. OK, say here, yeah, this present value. It's only numbers and i. For profit present value defecting, it's as well just numbers and i. Mm -hmm. I will not go through everything here, because this is just algebra. But what you get is that in order to sustain cooperation, your discount rate should be less than 0 0.0978. Mm -hmm. I have got a question about this exercise from uh, someone in your group. Uh, and the question was um, actually regarding these formulas. Because in the book, what they do, they simplify everything and try to give you like the last formula. Um, so I would say that to memorize 
the formula itself is not the right way. Because say if you just miss some point somewhere, yeah, you get the wrong solution. It is always better to remember how to derive the thing. And the utility is very logical. Yeah? And here, instead of memorizing the formulas, because they are quite weird, better to memorize what is the logic, how I can, um, how I can come to this formula myself. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly this way. Well, breathe out. This is, I think, the hardest stuff or the most of calculation that you can get in an exam. So don't be so anxious about that. But do you understand how this works? At least the logic. Mm -hmm. Because the numbers here are too large in a way. So you can imagine that if we have, say, two here, four here, and three here, then the calculation are very simple. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's it for game theory. Now we go, go to models. So this is chapter 8, the development of theory. And we go to... to exercise 2. From some of you, I have got a question about Cournot duopoly or Cournot model for many firms. What if we have more than two? Mm -hmm. and here, this is exactly this case. Um, we have a an oligopoly that consists of three identical firms. So this is chapter eight, problem two. Mm -hmm. So the profit or the price is 100 minus two Q. I have number of firms equal to three, and marginal costs are equal to average cost for all companies, and this is 20. So what is the Cournot-Nash equilibrium output in the industry for each firm? Um, in your handbook, you have this general result yeah, with some ends. Do you understand how it is derived? It's very, very simple. Um, I will write it here because this is another example in a way. So what if we have this demand function, marginal costs are equal to 10, and as, instead of three firms, we have some large number, say n. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, uh, how many. From here, I know that this is the total output in the industry. Mm -hmm. Each firm produces some QI. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this total output will be QI multiplied by this n. Mm -hmm. Here I have symmetric cost structure. That's why I can expect that everything will be symmetric in this uh, model. Yeah? Uh, and now imagine that I am firm 1. I look at this, and my demand curve will look in this way. So this me then the rest of the market is n minus 1 mm -hmm, to the qi and minus my q that I produce myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, this uh, q1 is as well qi, because they are equal. Mm -hmm. But when I maximize my profit, my marginal revenue, this is still constant for me, because mm -hmm. this is my residual demand curve. This will be n minus 1 qi. And here I apply my twice steep rule to qi, mm -hmm. because this is my production. Here uh, I apply uh, the rule. And then I equate this to marginal cost. And this is 10. What I get? 90 minus uh, n minus 1 qi minus 2 qi is equal to 0. So here I get 90 
minus n plus 1, so I put this into the bracket, mm -hmm, to qi. And this is again equal to 0. So what I get, this is qi, this is my production of one company, yeah, is equal to, uh, no, this is minus here, 90 divided by n plus 1. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But what is the total output? This is Q, QI, divide, uh, multiplied by N. So total Q will be N multiplied by 90 divided by N plus 1. Mm -hmm. So and this is the result that you get in the handbook. But look at this 90. What is this? This is actually this 100 minus marginal costs. Huh? And what is this? Right. This is the competitive output. What if price is equal to marginal costs? Mm -hmm. So if I say that P is equal to marginal costs, then I would say that price on the market will be 10. Mm -hmm. uh, with price equal to 10, my output is equal to 90. Mm -hmm. Competitive output. And this is this 90. So now from here, what I can say that, well, what if I have three companies on the market, mm -hmm. like in this case? Say, OK, say, first of all, I have to find my uh, competitive output. What would be if the industry structure would be perfect competition? Price is equal to marginal costs. This is equal to 20. With price equal to 20, I can find the uh, output. Mm -hmm. Q will be equal to 40, right? Mm -hmm. Because here I have this 2. Mm -hmm. I know that my n is equal to 3. So Q equal to 40 is equal to n. Uh, OK, right. No, 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 this is not right. Um, total output is 40, so that will be 3 to n plus, uh, plus uh, 3, 4 to 40. Yeah? And this is equal to uh, this is equal to 30. Yeah? So and this is my total output Q. Then from here, I, multi I divide it by 3. And Q produced by each company is equal to 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. So from, he from this formula, mm -hmm. I get the following, that uh, in order to find the total output in the industry, I take the competitive output and multiply it by N divided by N plus 1. I apply the same logic. I want to find my competitive output what would be produced if there was perfect competition. Mm -hmm. To find this perfectly competitive output, I find the price. Price is equal to marginal costs. So it is equal to 20. With price equal to 20, I say 20 is equal to 100 minus 2Q. Mm -hmm. From here, I derive that competitive output would be equal to 40. And then I say that, well, if this is competitive output, this is oligopolistic output. This is n divided by n plus 1. Mm -hmm. From here, I get production by one company. Mm -hmm. Make sense? OK, probably not. <laughs> um, do you want to have but a break? In perfect competition, what about the monopoly situation when you want to? Well, OK, if this is monopoly situation, you have always one firm. Yeah, this is the oligopolistic market with three. The alternative here would be to see just one short uh, thing before the break. Okay, but what is, what if I have, say, this demand, I have three firms, mm -hmm, but marginal cost of one firm is equal to 10, marginal cost of another is equal to 15 marginal cost of the third one is equal to, say, 17. 
what to do then? Yeah? Because then I have not a symmetric case. I cannot ex uh, apply this reasoning. I have to do something else. And actually, there is no need to do something else. You should ju do just the same as you always do. Uh, one firm, OK, say the uh, demand function will look like following. This is q1 minus q2 minus q3. Mm -hmm. This is total output q. And then again, you put on shoes of one firm. Say this is firm 1. Its residual demand curve is like this. Yeah? So it applies twice a steep rule. Marginal revenue of first firm would be 100 minus, Q, uh, minus Q2 minus Q3 and twice a steep rule minus 2Q1. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then I equate it to 10 marginal cost of firm 1. Then I think about firm 2. And again, I, I do the same. 100 minus Q1. This is residual demand curve. Minus Q3 and twice a steep rule. 2Q2. Two two. Mm -hmm. And I take its marginal costs. It's 15. And now you can guess that with the third one, I do exactly the same. 100 minus Q1 minus q2 minus 2q3 yeah twice a steep rule 2q3 and it is equal to 17. Um, so I have a system of equations I have three equations and three unknowns. Simple alg algebra from here I derive my q's and tada we are done yeah it's just the same a little bit more calculations yeah. What if we have break just 10 minutes and then we can cover more? Okay, good. Then I see you in 10 minutes.